Um, so welcome to the Math A31 AMAX Final Exam Review Seminar. Okay. I hope everyone is feeling excited for the upcoming exams. Yeah. Do we feel ready though? 50-50. Okay. Well, we're going to solve the other 50% here tonight. Um, first, I want to clarify something. Um, the size of the room that was booked for this seminar has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with AMAX. Okay? It's the registrar's fault. You can blame the registrar for the small room. Uh, apparently, they don't allow clubs to book large lecture halls. Okay? So, we're going to have the seminar here, but there's good news. We have a, what's it called, videographer? Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yeah. A, a person with a camera who's going to be recording the seminar and then putting it on YouTube. Okay? So you guys can then go to the AMAX YouTube page and watch parts again or tell your friends who couldn't make it today um, to watch that. All right. So here's how this is going to work. You guys are going to ask the questions, okay? And I'm going to try to answer them. The same way as for the midterm review seminar. If there are any extended pauses, moments of silence, nobody wants to ask anything, then I have a few questions prepared, okay? But let's start with you guys. So, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> yeah? What fuel? Roll's theorem? What fuel? Yeah. Yeah. Roll's theorem says the following. Okay? So this is something that you're gonna need to know for the final. Okay? Roll's theorem and the generalization of it, the mean value theorem, states the following. That if a function starts at the x-axis and ends also at the x-axis, and it's continuous everywhere on this closed interval, say this point is A and that point is B, okay? If the function is continuous on the closed interval A to B and differentiable on the open interval A to B, then there's a point somewhere within the open interval where the derivative is zero, okay? That's Rolle's theorem, all right? You can look up the formal definition in the book. Um, I can write it very quickly here. Um, a function, uh, that's continuous, that's my abbreviation for continuous, cont um, on the closed interval A to B, and diff, that means differentiable, on the open interval A to B, and also satisfies um, f of A is zero, which is f of B, okay? That's just saying that we start at the x-axis and we also end at the x-axis. If we also satisfy this, then there exists a point C within the open interval A to B such that f of C, rather f prime of C, is equal to zero, okay? Uh, the proof of this theorem is sort of a proof by explanation, okay? The function could either go up and come down or go down and come up. Okay? We either have a minimum or we have a maximum, and we know from another theorem, sometimes called Fermat's theorem, uh, that if a function has a maximum or a minimum, then the derivative is zero at that point, assuming differentiability, of course. Okay? So, if the function has a maximum, we know that there exists such a point by Fermat's theorem. If the function has a minimum, we also know there exists such a point by Fermat's theorem. And if the function doesn't have a maximum or a minimum, that means it has to be constant and therefore its derivative is zero everywhere. Cool. That's the proof of the Rolle's theorem. Yes? And if the global extremum are cause of the end point A and B, then they, what do you do? So if the global extrema is the, at, the, the, at the point of F A and F B. Uh, right, so if, if F of B so, so the function starts here and ends here. So if these are extrema, then the function would have to be constant, right? I mean, if the function goes up, right, and then comes down and hits B over here, okay, there's the global extremum right there, right? 
these ones are global minima. But all we really care about is that there's a point over here that there's a maximum, and so the tangent line there is going to be horizontal, slope zero. Yeah. And if we have the minimum case, then we have the opposite. Now, notice the function could you know, bounce around several times and have several maxes and mins, several points where f prime is zero. Okay? So this is just an existence theorem. It says there exists such a point, doesn't tell us where it is or how to find it or how many. All right? Um, there's another theorem which is related to this one. Actually, it's equivalent to this one. You can get it assuming Rolle's theorem, and it reduces to Rolle's theorem. It's a generalization, but it is equivalent to this, called the mean value theorem. Okay? The MVT. The MVT um, says basically the same thing as Rolle's theorem. We have a function that's continuous on a closed interval, differentiable on an open interval, um, except we, we lose this condition. Okay, we don't need that for the mean value here. Okay, so for the MVT, a function, let me just write this down and then we'll go through an argument of how to get MVT from Rolle's theorem. A function <coughs> plot on a closed interval A to B and diff on open interval A to B. Um, so we're assuming there's such a function. Okay, um, then there exists a point C inside A to B such that um, F prime of C is equal to F of B minus F of A over B minus A. Okay, there's the mean value theorem. All right, why is it called the mean value theorem? Well, let's just draw a graph here to illustrate this. Let's say A is here and B is here, okay? So we have a curve that looks like this, except we don't necessarily start and end at the x-axis. We could start, you know, here, let's say, and end over here, and we have, you know, our function do something like that, okay? Now, f of B minus f of A over B minus A, right? There's f of A, there's f of B up here, Okay, this is just the slope of the secant line, or the line connecting these two points over here. All right, let's just draw that in a dotted way. There we go. There's the secant line. Okay, so with slope f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So what the mean value theorem is saying is that there exists a point somewhere in the middle here where the derivative, or the slope of the tangent line to f, is exactly equal to this slope. There exists a point somewhere here it would be on this graph where the tangent line has exactly the same slope as the secant line, okay? So similar to Rolle's theorem, except tilted, okay? Rolle's theorem says we start and end at the same heights. We have such a point where the tangent line is horizontal or parallel to this line over here, okay? Mean value theorem is more general, but I promised that you could get it from Rolle's theorem and now we're going to see how, okay? This is a short little proof. It is in the book, but I'll take three minutes to write it um, because the idea is important, okay? This is how you can think about generalizing things in math, okay? You have a more general looking picture than you do here. However, there are some key similarities. It is essentially the same kind of result, except everything is shifted, okay? It is rotated or, you know, tilted, whatever you want to call it, okay? In order to prove the MVT from rolls, we can tilt things back, okay? So here's the trick. To prove MVT, assuming, okay, Rolle's theorem, we define a new function, we define h of x, okay, in terms of f of x as follows. We're going to take the function f of x and we're going to subtract away the secant line, okay? So we're going to define h of x to be f of x minus secant line, okay? What will that do? From a, it'll subtract, from, from the point here at a, it's going to subtract the value of the secant line there, so it's going to take away f of a at A, okay, cool, so that point's gonna be dropped down to zero. 
same thing up over here, right? If we subtract away the secant line, at this end point, we're subtracting f of b minus f of b. That'll reduce it to zero as well. So we're going to get a new function, h, which is going to be looking like this, OK? We're subtracting the secant line away. We're going to get a bump looking like that instead of this, OK? So let's do this. What is the equation of the secant line? Well, there's the slope, right? There's the slope. OK, cool. There's the slope times, OK, x minus a plus f of a, right? Point slope formula, you guys know that, right? The, the line has this slope, passes through the point a, and has value f of a there, OK? If you don't understand how we got this, then just think through it, OK? You could just set up an equation, y equals mx plus b, or whatever, well not plus b because b is here, but y equals mx plus d, okay? And then sub in the slope, sub in a point, and then solve for, you know, whatever d would be, okay? And you'll get this equation if you do some factor. Um, okay, so cool. There's our new function, h of x, which is f of x minus the secant line, okay? Sometimes we call this an auxiliary function. I'm not going to attempt to write that word. You guys get it. Differentiate, okay? Since f is differentiable, h is differentiable, okay? h prime of x is equal to f prime of x minus f of b minus f of a over b minus a, okay? The other stuff reduces to zero. So, what the mean or what the what Rolle's theorem applied to h of x now is saying is that there exists a point such that h prime of c is zero. Okay, there exists a point c somewhere here, such that h prime of c is zero. And we see that if we sub in c there and we move that to the other side, we're gonna get the mean value there. Alright? Maybe I should write a, a, a bit first before I move to that step. Um, first, let's actually check that if you sub in a or b you do get zero. Let me just put that step in quickly. Notice uh, that h of a equals zero, which is h of b, right? We sub in a, f of a, that becomes zero, f of a minus f of a is zero. Cool. If we sub in b, we get f of b, b minus a, these cancel out, cancel, cancel, yeah, you can work through it. That's zero as well. Cool. Okay? So h of a is 0, h of b is 0, um, h is Kant on a to b, because f is, and, and diff on the open interval a to b, also because f is, OK? Um, and therefore, so Rolle's applies to h of x. And what do we know from Rolle's? There exists C such that H prime of C, 0, equals H prime of C, which is equal to F prime of C minus F of B minus F of A over B minus A. The derivative formula that I derived just a minute ago. Okay? And then you bring that over and you get the statement for, for F. Okay? There we go. So that's the, that's the proof of the mean value theorem, assuming Rolle's theorem. Okay. All right. Any questions about that? Yeah. Why are the h a and h b equal zero? Oh, just sub in a and b, and you'll see why. Like if you put in x equals a, right? A minus a is zero. So this whole part gets zeroed out, and we get f of a minus f of a, which is zero. Same thing if you sub in b. If you sub in b, these cancel. And you get f of a minus f of b plus f of a minus f of a by expanding, and stuff cancels out. Okay, so that's just a, that's just a chatter. All right. Yeah. So there we go. There's the MBT. Could this be asked on the final exam? Yeah. It could. It's a pretty short proof, right? Assuming Rolle's theorem, it's a pretty short proof. Rolle's theorem itself is a short proof. It's an explanatory proof. Um, 
try to remember the idea, okay? Don't remember how the function h of x is defined because, because you won't, okay? There, there's too much to remember here. Just think through, okay? Think about the idea. What are we trying to do? We're subtracting the secant line. Ah, okay. So now all we gotta do is find the equation of the secant line. What's the equation? Well, this is the slope, it passes through the point A. There we go, okay? So think things through rather than trying to memorize them, all right? Okay, any other questions? Yes? Um, how to deal with um, the graphs with slant asymptotes? Oh, yeah, slant S slant like slanted uh, uh, oblique asymptotes? Uh, yeah, you guys want to do a curve sketching question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Who's got an example? Who's got a question? Otherwise, I'm going to make one up. Yeah? 1 over under root x cubed minus 1. Uh, yeah, okay. So let's, uh, let's erase some of this stuff. Let's erase this. Because we all know why we're here. Okay. So, uh, curve sketching. Okay, what was your uh, one over under root? Square root? Yeah, uh, x cubed minus one. X cubed minus one? Yeah. Yikes, okay. <laughs> Fine, let's do that. Okay. Um, all right, so there we go. We have one over the square root of x cubed minus one. In curve sketching questions, there are nine steps, okay? Nine steps in each curve sketching question. Step one, okay? In these nine steps, you're gonna find all the information you need to know about f in order to graph it, okay? Step one. Domain. Yeah, domain. Okay. When we are asking about the domain, we want to think about, are there any potential problems with this? Can we always take a square root? Can we always do one over? What are some problems? Division by zero, negative under the square root. There are other problems if you add other functions. For example, you can't take log of a negative number, but there are no logs here. Here it's only division or root. Is there a problem with square rooting x cubed minus one? Yeah. Right, when do we have a problem? Yeah, when x is less than 1, okay? When x is less than 1, x cubed is also less than 1. How do I know that? Because I know what x cubed looks like. It looks like this. There's 1, there's 1. If x is less than 1, x cubed is less than 1, okay? So we need x to be greater than 1. And the inequality here is strict because if we have equality, we'll get division by 0, okay? So the domain is this, okay? How do you write it, by the way? This is sloppy notation. You can write it like this. The set of all x's in R such that x is bigger than one, okay? Or you can write it like this, one to infinity, okay? Or you can write it like this, x belongs to R greater than one, like that. Take your pick, okay? So there's the domain. What is step two? Intercept. Intercept. Intercept, sure. X and Y ints, okay? One of these is easy, one of these could be harder. What's the easy one? Y intercept. Y intercept is the easy one, because all you gotta do is sub in X is zero. We can't do that, because that's not in the domain. Cool, okay? No Y int, all right? What about the X int? We set the thing equal to zero, and then we attempt to solve, okay? No x int. How do I know that? Because if we set one over root x cubed minus one equal to zero, um, what x would we need? Well, one over, there's nothing here that you could put such that one over it would be zero, okay? So there's no solution, okay? No solution. Of course, if x gets larger and larger, if x tends to infinity, then yeah, we do get one over this is zero, okay? But that is not an intercept, that's, that's gonna be an asymptote, okay? Which brings us to step three, okay? Asymptote. Okay? 
So there are two types of asymptotes. Well, okay, there are three. Well, okay, there are more. But for you guys, yeah, there's like parabolic asymptotes. There's you know whatever you want, right? Um, you know, any any curve could be potentially an asymptote, right? Um, so for you guys, it's horizontal, straight line, vertical, or slanted. So y equals mx plus b. Yes, there are also asymptotes that look like parabolas. If the degree of the top is two more than the degree of the bottom in a rational function, for example. Okay. Yeah, you won't see that. Don't worry. Okay. Asymptotes. In this case, we have only vertical and horizontal. By the way, if you have a horizontal asymptote, you cannot have a slanted asymptote. Okay? Think about why. So, we have good news here. We have a horizontal asymptote. How do you check for horizontal asymptotes? You take a limit. Okay? So, horizontal asymptotes. This is how you check for it. To check, you take the limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity of the function you're dealing with. Okay? That's how you find a horizontal asymptote. You see what the function tends to as you go off to infinity in either direction. They're not necessarily equal. In this case, we don't even have to check the negative infinity case because that's not even in the domain. We only need to check the positive infinity case. So let's do it. The limit as x goes to infinity, 1 over square root x cubed minus 1. What is the limit? Zero. Zero. Very good. Okay. So there is a horizontal asymptote and it's y equals 0. So y equals 0 is a horizontal asymptote. Okay? All right. Vertical asymptote. Let's get rid of this rolls thing. Get rid of that. Okay. Um, vertical asymptotes. So this is still under heading 3. Um, here's what we do for vertical asymptotes. We figure out when we get division by 0. That's what produces a vertical asymptote. Or when we take log of 0. We don't have a log over here. Okay? So we need only to check division by zero, okay? Check division by zero or log zero, okay? Um, so we need to check division by zero. We already determined we do get division by zero when x is equal to one. So we have a vertical asymptote there, okay? What's in that room, by the way? Like, what's past that door? <laughs> Is it a room which, like, you it's can't get? Oh, it's a hallway. Yeah. I've never looked in this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. I've been at this school for, like, uh, some number of years. Um, many. And I've never even <laughs> knew that. Okay, cool. You learn something new every day. All right. Um, so, check for division by zero. Uh, yes, we do have a division by zero problem, and it's at x equals one. So we have a have a vertical asymptote at x equals one. Okay. By the way, when you're asked to find equations of asymptotes, don't just say zero. Say y equals zero. Don't just say one. Say x equals one. These are equations. Similarly, for a slanted asymptote, you want to say y equals m x plus b. Okay, you want to find both m and b. We'll do an example of the slanted asymptote real soon. Okay, let's finish this for now. So that's step three. Step four. What do we do for step four? Uh, derivatives. Yeah. Okay. At this point, we can start taking derivatives. Um, actually, there is a there is a step before that. Yeah. Symmetry with two m's, by the way. Okay. Um, yeah. You guys can tell I just figured that out, but that word had two M's just last week, maybe. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't look like it should have two M's. Anyway, that's a lot of bumps. One, two, three, four. Anyway, uh, yeah, so there's none. Okay. How do you check for symmetry? You sub in negative X for X, or you, and you figure out what you get, right? If you sub in negative X in there, and you end up getting the same thing, then the function's even. If you end up getting negative of the function, then the function's odd, okay? How do I know there's no symmetry here before even subbing anything in? The domain, exactly. We don't even go past zero, so how can there be symmetry, okay? So there's none. Okay, step five, derivative. 
Uh, so, so I'll just call this f prime. Okay. So first derivative. Uh, we want to solve for f prime of x. So let's just take that derivative there. Um, a good way not to have to fool around with the root would be to do something like this. We're going to write um, f of x in this way, x cubed minus 1 to the negative half, okay? And then drop the negative half, all right? So now let's take the derivative here. This is going to be negative half x cubed minus 1 to the negative 3 over 2. I'm subtracting 1 away, times 3x squared, okay? And now we can change it back to the form we wanted, okay? This is a multiply sign. This is negative 3 over 2 x squared over um, the square root of x cubed minus 1 uh, cubed. Yeah, OK. All right, nasty looking function. But at least it's easy to work with, right? Once we have the derivative, we're going to do two things. First, we're going to figure out the critical points. What's a critical point? Yeah, when the derivative is zero, okay? So this is step five. So within step five, there are two sub-steps, all right? So step 5.1 is find, find the critical points, or the CP. That's how you abbreviate it, okay? These are points where the derivative is zero or where the derivative is undefined. Now, in this case, we have a very easy task here. To find the points where the derivative is zero, we set this equal to zero, and we see right away there's only one solution, and that's at zero. So do we have a critical point or not? No, because zero is not in the domain, okay? Do we have a point where the derivative is undefined? Where? One. At one. But we already know that that's a problem point because we have a vertical asymptote there, okay? So actually, there are no critical points here at all, okay? When you're checking for critical points, you're checking where the derivative is zero or where it's undefined, and where it's undefined, it only counts as a critical point if that point is in the domain, okay? If we already have a vertical asymptote there, that can't be a critical point because that's not even in the domain, all right? So in this case, we have none, okay? This is where f prime is equal to zero or f prime undefined, okay? Now, step 5.2 is once you find the critical point, critical points, then you're gonna draw your little table, okay? And figure out where the derivative is positive, negative, or change sign, all right? In this case, we have no critical points, so the task is easy. This derivative is either always positive or always negative. Which is it? Positive. It's always positive, yeah. right? Why? Well, uh, no, 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 no. It's always oh, negative. <laughs> yeah, that tricky little negative sign. So this part is always positive, right? Because under the square root, the square root always returns a positive. You cube it, okay, that's positive. X is bigger than one, so X squared is positive. So all this is positive, but we do have that negative sign there, okay? Um, I was just thinking there for a minute, if the derivative was always positive, there would be no way to draw that graph, you know, to have these properties. So that's one way that you know if you're doing stuff right, okay? All right, so we have no points where it's undefined. Step 5.2, signs of f prime. In this case, f prime of x is negative for all x less than, greater than 1, all right? There we go. So that tells you what? F is always decreasing. Now, I promised there were nine steps. In this example, you really don't need anything else. Okay? You don't need any more steps. I can draw that graph right now. And you can too. Let's do it. So we're going to skip to step nine now. Okay? What does the graph look like? We have a vertical asymptote, okay, right here at 1. We have a horizontal asymptote at 0. The function approaches the vertical asymptote like this, all right? We know it's decreasing the whole way, okay? 
There we go. There's the curve. Now make sure that you don't make a, a silly algebra error and then mess everything up. Um, so then you'll know. Um, in this case, again, like there's only one way to draw this graph, okay? Um, and think about why you can't have an inflection point here. But I mean, if you want, you can take the second derivative. It's not going to hurt, and show that there's no points where it's equal to zero. Okay? We can do it real quick. Um, the second derivative of that function would be the first derivative of this, right? So we copy our negative three over two, uh, and then use quotient rule, right? Fine. The derivative of the top is 2x times the bottom, okay, minus the derivative of the bottom. <laughs> yeah, homework for you guys. <laughs> All right. And then to check if your graph is right, this is what you do, okay? You're going to go on your phones, not on the exam, of course, <laughs> um, and you're going to go to Desmos, okay? I have Desmos downloaded and you're gonna punch this in. Let me just check that I actually did do this right because this is going on uh, a YouTube and I don't wanna look like an idiot. Okay, so x to the power of three minus one to the power, to the power 0 0.5. All right, yeah, it's right. Okay, cool. All right, so that's how you check your answer. And by the way, Desmos is really a lot of fun. Like if you're riding the bus or something, I ride like an hour and a half to get here. And I just play with Desmos like all the time. You know, I know how to grab like so many different functions. Anyway, any questions about this stuff? Yes. Could you explain like how to find like flat asymptotes? And yeah. how to like figure out like what the equation of the flat asymptote is? Yeah, of course. But not with this example because there's no flat asymptote. Um, we'll do it in a minute. Any questions about this example specifically? 